on my shoulder said brother Jackson he says I want to be where truth is at and I have to say this is a day that there's a lot of voices out in this world we live in and many times these voices are out here to try to make you become part of a universal domestic society of people modern man has got his own philosophy how we should live on this planet Thank you, Brother Allen. But I have to say, a lot of the things we're hearing today, it's never going to pan out. It's never going to work. So tonight, while I'm getting me a little drink of water, you turn with me in the 83rd Psalm. We're still much on the same trend of thought. But we have to, in that, <clears throat> we have to look also and recognize conditions that's going on about us today in every sector and facet of life. No matter whether it's the entertainment world, music world, political, intellectual, or the medical world. I had them all sit down here in an order. They've all put God aside. We don't need God. And I have to say tonight, right now the human race needs God's worse than they leave it, need anything else. Because little do they realize something is about to blow and take place across the horizon of time. Not only is there going to be terrible, devastating earthquakes, but in many places there's going to be devastating diseases suddenly hit society. I see where this wealthy... Gates has donated a hundred million dollars over the next few years to study, to help back, help create a vaccine to get rid of AIDS. You know, brothers and sisters, to me, AIDS did not start from a little monkey in Africa. It started when two-legged monkeys that could talk and walk upright and walk on the main streets of cities in Africa and such, they begin to indulge in a lifestyle, and God just said to the devil, now you can go and have them. It wasn't long that kind was traveling the world 
to introduce more people because they had a problem and it's a tragedy to think that the medical world and our political world, even the intellectual world, begins to say, but we've got to do something about this. Well, why didn't they do the right thing? Stop living that lifestyle. It's that lifestyle that started this thing. That's God's curse. Now, that might, now when I say that's God's curse, look, I realize today there's little children born with it. It's not their fault. So take my words with a wise analysis. I know what I'm saying. And then when people around our college campuses begin to lay around, indulging in all kinds of illicit sex and stuff, shooting each other with needles, same needles, passing from one to another, how else can they become anything else but subject to a chronic disease and a lifestyle? And not none in the so-called leadership bracket, in whatever facet you want to look at, they all seem to like take more for them, feeling sorry. Brother, if you play around with nitroglycerin and you don't know what it can do, and you've been warned, I'm not going to stay around where you're playing with it. I'm going to get as far away as I possibly can. Because I know sooner or later you're going to make the wrong move. You're going to do the wrong foolish thing. And you're not going to blow yourself up. You're going to blow up a lot of other people. They're going to become innocent victims of your stupidity and all of that kind of stuff. So tonight, we're continuing a little bit along this same line. But I want to use this text. Because when we pick this up, the political world don't need God. Somehow or other, in the Western world, in the last 50 years, yes, high technology, all the new invented contraptions they have invented to play with. And I have to say, It had to be God that gave them the ability to invent the stuff. There's never been anything invented out of season. They would have never been an automobile if there hadn't been a young man born somewhere in time. He got tired of hunters and a hard horse. He got tired of working in his daddy's leather shop. And he began to figure out something, what he could do. So after a while, they made a combustible engine. And from that, they just kept modifying, improving. And I have to say to the intellectual world, you, didn't, you did not invent anything. You only capitalized on something other that God had used the brains of a young man somewhere to invent it to start with. If you find all of the world's inventions, go back and see the man, read about the man that invented it. There was no books that told them how to make the steam engine. A man watched a tea kettle and he got an idea. And from that, brothers and sisters, so has it been with other things. Because I have to say, God's the creator, and he gives the technology and the mind to people. Some of us been used wrong. God's not responsible for that. The Bible speaks they're inventors of evil things. Well, I have to believe, brother and sister, most inventions are made, and it has a good point if it's used rightly. But if it's used wrongly, then we can say, well, would to God had never been invented. Well, if you'd use it the right way. And I can look back, brothers and sisters, when we first started going to the tabernacle and hearing Brother Branham in years gone by. Yes, at that time, television was just coming on the scene. And all because there's certain illicit wrong things. They didn't have sex on TV or anything then. But a lot of the programs did not advertise the right lifestyle. Yes, preachers jumped on it with all four feet. 
Now notice I said all four feet. I have a purpose in saying that. Because I'll never forget years ago, my wife lived on down, had some relatives, lives on down in the country a little ways. And we was going to spend a Sunday, Sunday dinner with them, go to church with them. It was a United Brethren Church. So we went. We're sitting there in the United Brethren Church, and they're having the Sunday school class, so me and the wife were sitting in the adult area. And I never got involved in any of the discussions or anything. But after, <clears throat> after the Sunday school part was over, they asked me to say a little something. So I got up for a few minutes and said a few things. And I'll never forget this elderly man, just a farmer. And he said, young man, he says, you know, and I've looked back on that. He says, I remember when there was not an automobile. And when the first automobile come chugging down the road, everybody was saying, that's an instrument of hell. Scares the horses. They have runaways. They have accidents. People get hurt. Look what it is. And preachers was using that in their sermons. The thing ought never been invented. Been invented. But he said, you know, preachers got up on the, we will say in their churches, Damn the automobile. Condemn it to hell. It's an instrument of hell. But he says, you know, when the next generation of preachers come along, they was driving one. And he said, the church went on. So same way it was, he said, by the radio. When they first invented the radio and they heard an advertisement of tobacco on it. Say, it's an instrument of hell. So the preacher jumped onto the radio. But the next generation of preachers, they was all preaching on it. And he says, it's the same way with the TV. He says, now the preachers have got the TV. They're using it. He said, the instrument out of hell. But he said, you watch. The next generation, they'll all be preaching on it. So it's a matter how you use the thing. You can, you, you can take any good thing and use it in extreme. And it's going, to be proved, it's going to be proved to be an enemy to you. So now then tonight, <clears throat> turn with me to the 83rd Psalm. How many times I've read it. I've read it here before. <clears throat> but I remember when this problem began to start in Israel. And the lady that we have communication with once in a while, she says, Brother Jackson, she says, have you read the 83rd Psalm? I said, well, I have read it. But she says, read it again. She says, that's a prophecy and it's going on right now. So I'm going to read it. Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace. And be not still, O God, for lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. The tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagridines and so on and so forth. That's a prophecy, brothers and sisters. All of these, we will say, these alien names here are what you have categorized in the Palestinians today. Especially the Edomites and the Moabites. And look at our intellectual political world. Have you heard any man any political man, no matter what part of the globe they're from, have you heard any man say, but we shouldn't do that. That's God's chosen people. You don't hear nobody say anything to defend them. So the psalm is a prophecy. It's right. They've all become enemies to the children of Israel. They've consented and they're confederated together and they're actually saying, Let's fix it so they'll never be a nation no more. Look what our, our exit president did. Consulting with Barack. Who is as liberal as he can be. Here he plainly says, You ought to be willing to give up the old city Jerusalem, the holy temple spots. And you know, these things, brothers and sisters, have been cherished by the Jewish people for centuries of time. Because through the centuries of time and all of their... International dispersion. 
They have many times went through the rituals of the Passover season. And then they would say, next year in Jerusalem, next year in Jerusalem. But then when things opened up in 48, that UN then consented to partition a little piece of land that they could have a beginning. Even brothers and sisters up till the Six Day War, world leaders, many of them still, was willing to work with the Jewish leaders to the survival, the preservation, and the growth of the Israelite nation to preserve it. And I know I read the article in a magazine because there's a certain movement of Jews along with some Gentiles. They call it the temple movement. They are people that set aside vast sums of money with plans to build the temple if and whenever the time comes it can be built. And I've said this, brothers and sisters, God don't have to have a movement planning, setting aside money to even start it. Because in Haggai, the second chapter, when those prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, saw that little temple being then decorated, and there was men right there that are grieved in their hearts because the temple was too small, because they had not had the money and the finances to build it larger. Then God, through the mouths of those prophets, spoke to them. How many of you here that saw this house in its former state? So the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former. So that right there says, because the gold and the silver is mine, saith the Lord. So when God said that, brothers and sisters, 500 years before the advent of Christ, don't think God needs to take up an offering and he needs a bunch of people saving money, setting aside so much for the building of the temple. I'm sure that God will use it. But brothers and sisters, when you read Isaiah, the 60th chapter, I don't see that bunch of people going around taking up offering. I see people coming willingly, gratefully, wanting to be and come involved in this thing. Why else would kings and princes and queens come bringing their gifts and their offerings? I have to say tonight, it's sad that the religious world don't even read the Bible like they should read it. So tonight as we're sitting here together, let's begin to realize... I have to say, we are a privileged people, not because of myself, but I have to say, God has a people today that's got an ear to hear. They've got a heart to believe something with. They've got a mind that's stable. They can see with their eyes what's going on at large in the world. But somehow or other, something down in here says that's not right. One of these days, God is going to put a, a, call a halt to all of this stuff. So I have to say to the young people, it's a wonderful thing to be able to stand in this pulpit and look out across the congregation of young people. They don't come in here wearing shorts. God have mercy when people get so ornery, so prefixed to the idols of the world that they got to go anywhere half naked. Nothing becomes a sacred place anymore where they can respect the name of God or such. But I grew up in an hour of time, brothers and sisters, just to drive down an old country road and there's a church house. There was something that told you that's supposed to be a sacred place. Really, in, a, in actuality, brothers, it's not any more sacred than anything else. But it's where God is supposed to be respected. And it's where people, brothers and sisters, years ago, when they go by, they respect it for what it stood for, what was said there, the people that went there to learn and have their lives changed. And I have to say, the devil has sure done a good business and a good job by disarranging the young lives of countless teenagers today that's born into this world, they don't know what right from wrong is. They're just absolutely exposed to a lifestyle and a lot of corrupt things in our school systems. And I have to say to the young teachers here, please, never will I say this. it's wrong for you to be a school teacher. You go on and teach those classes. Teach those kids how to learn to add two and two and such. But I have to say, I got one over on you. I live, brothers and sisters, when we could go to school and the teacher could say, let's stand and recite the Lord's Prayer. Or let's stand and let's salute the flag. We got an element of people today. They, well, that's wrong also. No wonder America is sliding, slipping fast to a moral, ethical decay. And then when they wonder, well, what are we going to do about all this crime? They say, well, crime is down. No, it's not. I just heard it said about two weeks ago on a TV Place one night. Crime of certain descriptions has it told it in California how much it had rised. And I said, that's a lie for them to say it has decreased. 
There it is. Out there it has increased. When absolutely teenage kids, 11 and 12 year old boys, roaming in gangs, worse than a pack of dogs, roaming neighborhoods, picking on old people, robbing, killing, cutting their throats, beating old men up. I never heard of such stuff when I was a child growing up. If you think, brothers and sisters, men 50 years ago would have stood still while some two, two or three smart aleck 12 year olds picked on an old man, they'd have took them kids apart and sent them kids home with some stripes on them. But they're not allowed to do it today. And so we, then we hire a bunch of young men, we send them off to college to learn how to be a policeman. But then, brothers and sisters, we teach them. Now, don't you use that gun only under certain situations. Brothers and sisters, it wasn't 50 years ago like that. Well, do you think it's right to kill? I'll say this. If you stop a man on the highway and he stops and the policeman says, come back to my car. You get out, mind your own business. Nine times out of ten, that policeman's not going to shoot you. But you sit there in that car, act like you're going to pull a gun, and you portray yourself like some idiot that you're as smart as he is. He has a right to protect his life and the office that he holds. And I have to say, you don't even have a belly aching chance in the eyes of God to say, well, it ain't right. Now, I don't care what you think in all this area, black or white. The only thing is, it just seemed like brothers and sisters, we got an element of people. They jump on every little situation. Amen. That's sad, it's pitiful, and God's not going to put up with it. Amen. And you're liable to see the fruits of this begin to come about in the next four years. Because brothers and sisters, you can laugh in, laugh in the face of God so long, that after a while I'll have to say, He can take the whole thing in His hand. And brother, he can bring about conditions in a society, in a neighborhood, that will make people bend their heads. And I'll have to say, we could be closer to it than we think we are right now. Because there's no doubt, this situation in the Middle East is moving step by step, week by week closer to that hour of time when it's going to blow. Yes, I read an article the other day, wherein it was said, I think it was in one of the pages of the Roots News, that they believed that the Arabs was getting ready for a global war. But then some political fellow here in the States, well, but it's possible, but it won't be unless Egypt consents, and Egypt hasn't done that yet. Brothers and sisters, when God said in His Word what He said, He meant it. He ain't going to ask no politician from the United States to say when it's to be and when it's not to be. He's going to let this thing blow right when you and I are the least expecting of it. So my brothers and sisters, I'm glad to have a book that we can put our confidence in. And I have to say, it would not be a joy to stand here with just a bunch of old, decrepit, senile, old age people that can't hardly get out the front door, get in the church house, without holding their back, walking on a cane. Now, I'm not making fun. I'm using it as an example. How many realize that? But it would be a, it would be a sad picture to see a congregation just made up of that kind of people. And there was not young people, brothers and sisters, that could balance a picture. I'd have to say, God deliver me. From living in a world that conditions have run out to such an extent, that there's not, a, there's not the heart of a young person that even wants to even partake of what you're talking about. And now remember look back, looking back to 93, 4, 5, and 6, when the moving of the Spirit began to take place in here. All you young people know. One day you're talking about other things in, out there in the world, the lifestyles and things. But my, the minute that God began to slay you, you just laying on the floor, you shaking under the power of God. Some of you was to dance and one along, you were speaking another language. Before we went home, you was all in a huddle with your arms around one another. You never felt so good because it was God. I have to say it was God getting you ready 
for the hours that's just right ahead of us. And I have to say tonight, thank God, he did in faith assembly just that very thing. It not only happened here, but it's went all over the world. And so I have to say, thank you, Lord. And I appreciate it. It's, it's bad sometimes, though, when people don't take it. And they just take it for granted. And they don't take it as really as a serious thing. But I have to say, what God did, brothers and sisters, is a serious thing. I have here in mind, in our intellectual world, every once in a while you pick up a paper and search it. If anything is said about uh, conservatism, getting back to the old ways, it isn't long. Some intellectual person is ready to step in and put a block in the pathway. Because if they think for one minute that you're trying to pull something back more or less to an old religious idea, then brothers, they, they're ready to separate you from that. And somebody stepped up here this morning and told me they had now found the remains of that woman. What was that infidel woman's name? They found her remains, all dissected, cut to pieces. Her and two other people. Well, I can't jump up and down and rejoice, but that was the creature that sent petitions across the land that got people's names to cause the U.S. Supreme Court to consent to give in and not have prayer in school, put the Bible out, and I have to say, see what her end was? Now, the people that believed her, they may not come now to as drastic an end, but you will, God gets through with them. There'll be a generation, brothers and sisters, God's liable to sink them right in the ground. And I cannot help but believe. He sunk people in the ground back in the Old Testament period. The ground just opened up and swallowed them. And there's a lot of people probably today in the intellectual world don't believe in such things. Just keep on boasting. Keep that big mouth a-going. And you might be surprised what God will do one of these days. He's liable to let the ground open up and swallow you, automobile and all. God's got ways, brothers and sisters, that man don't even realize that. He can do. But in the intellectual world, I got right here. You can get a lot of things off of the internet today. Up in Chicago, Yes, up in Chicago, a new university, this lady's name was Linda Waite. She was sort of like a sociologist. Someone heard her making a speech somewhere, and she was commenting on the fact that married people, it's proven. They wind up being happier. They wind up being healthier. And they usually wind up being more financially well off. Somebody heard that speech and they contacted the lady and thought that ought to be put in some kind of a book. So she in return was sooner or later introduced to another lady that thought well, and her name is Maggie Gallinger. The two of them together put, put together a manuscript all on this. And this is why I said the intellectual world don't want God nor the principles of God that has always followed his way of life and pattern. They put this all in a manuscript, getting it ready as though it was to go to be put in a book. But then this manuscript has to be proved by a board of critics. And this happened to be at Harvard. When they begin to read this, critic after critic says, well, it's not been scientific proved. God have mercy. You've been here 6,000 years. It was, that sci it was that kind of people that God used to bring you here. And all of a sudden, we got two generations that popped up here. It's not been scientific proved. I have to say, somebody better watch out. 
But nevertheless, though the critics disapproved of it, because this wasn't scientifically proved, this wasn't scientifically proved, that wasn't scientifically proved. Yet, brothers and sisters, when this was made known to certain printers, they're all after it, wanting to put it in book. And now then, brothers and sisters, these two ladies, they're getting offers after offers after offers. Let us print it, let us print it. I'll have to say, leave a condition alone long enough, and the fruits of it will sooner or later tell you the fact of it. And I have to believe tonight. When I said Sunday, uh, Thursday, uh, Thursday night what I did, I have to say, young people, <clears throat> I'm not bragging, please. We never had a lot of things back in the 30s and 40s. So we had nothing to complain about, and we didn't have a lot of things to brag about. We looked at life in a more simple way, as long as we had a little something other to eat of a morning. And we felt good. And we had a bed to sleep in. And a warm house. Even though in the hot summers we didn't have air conditioning because we didn't know what it was. Well, I tell you, we welcomed every good shower that ever came in the summertime. That cooled the air down. Oh, praise the Lord. But I tell you, along in the last part of July and August, when it would get to 103 every day, it wasn't nothing, brothers and sisters. You didn't go to bed. You just went and laid down somewhere with an old piece of a newspaper, and there you laid and fanned yourself asleep. But you never complained because, you know, the rich didn't have it much better when it comes to the heat. They might have had a few little things in the house to kind of circulate the air. But nevertheless, life was so simple. And I have to say, I praise God for that. You hear a lot said today, child labor, anti-child labor. My brothers and sisters, our strawberries was picked a lot of time by child labor. And them little kids come, brothers and sisters, to the berry patch, picking every gallon, enjoying every nickel or dime they got for picking them. Save their money to buy themselves shoes, a few items of necessity. And usually, brothers and sisters, most time, brothers and sisters, we didn't have a lot of shoes then. <clears throat> I can remember, right in the heart of the Depression, usually in a family structure, each person only had one pair of shoes. And that was good for the week and good for Sunday also. Now you might say, oh, now, Brother Jackson, you're just putting us on. No, I'm not. I wish I could turn the pages back and God would show it to you in the movie form. We would walk to Borden. It was in spring of the year. Maybe when freezing and thawing would still be a little effective at night. We would absolutely, brothers and sisters, walk barefooted part of the way until we would get to a certain place and we would sit down. And there we would wipe our feet off and put our socks on and go to church. Oh, you must have been poor. You've heard the old saying, it was poor as dirt go Job's turkey. But I have to say, we had some values and some principles in our mind. I'm not saying everybody was that way. But I know a lot of people that was that way. And young people, I can look back in those days and times when the summertime would come. There wasn't jobs that young boys could get here and there. They didn't have money running out their ears. They didn't even have cars that they could go see a girlfriend. Not even the girls had, had hardly a dime. So our dating was absolutely much more on a primitive lifestyle back then. There wasn't nothing for a boy to walk three miles to see a girl. Sit on the front porch. Pick berries, pick tomatoes. Do anything with his hands he could to make a few dollars. And this has been absolutely a fact. I can remember what one boy would say to another boy. I understand you've got a new pair of trousers. Now, I'm not painting you a picture that didn't exist. It did. Could I borrow him? I got a date. It wasn't nothing, nothing for a boy to borrow his friend's trousers just to go to see that date. 
And the girl didn't say, you got Ben's trousers on. You get away from me. It made Ben look pretty good. He could have went in his old dirty jeans, but they, they didn't do that back then. I have to say they had some principles about them. Now take my words, brothers and sisters, and take it and analyze it rightly. Because all through them 30s, there was very little money. And did you know, brothers and sisters, I can say this tonight, poverty does not create crime. That's a lie. Crime is started, but it's propagated. It's projected as a means of entertainment. And then young minds that have, they got nothing else to do. They've taken everything else away from the youth that's right and wrong. So the devil takes it, gets into their spirit, and he uses that to feed their ego. And I have to say, what a terrible hour we live in. I feel, in a way, I feel sorry for young people that's been subjected to all of this. You'll hear them say, <clears throat> child labor, goodness sakes alive. When a child was 12 years old back then, brothers and sisters, it was nothing to see them in a strawberry patch picking berries, picking tomatoes, picking beans, anything to make 50 cents or 75 cents a day. And they thought they had, they was rich. But we could go to Borden on a Saturday night and you could buy a Coke for a nickel. You could buy a Pepsi for a nickel. You could buy that ice cream cone, brothers and sisters, with it heaped up on top for a nickel. And you had to eat it right quick, brothers and sisters, or it was going to melt and run down through your fingers. That's the truth. We appreciated life. We appreciated what little we had access to partake of. But deep inside, I can remember all them young fellows around Borden and Pekin. I didn't know them all by name, but I can say this. When World War II came along, they weren't criminals, but they became soldiers that fired and fought and died on the battlefield to keep America free so that this bunch of devil stuff could come in and have a heyday in America. That's the America we live in now. And if God was to bring all them soldiers back out of the graves, off of the battlefields where they died, crying, Mama, Mama. Because many of them was brothers and sisters. They had never been away from Mama long enough to even know what it was to be away from home. It's a shame that our politicians have sold this nation down the drain to what it's become today. So as I'm saying these things, I'm not saying to belittle people. But we're comparing values, principles, with things that help to make a human being. Luxury never made anybody right. That's why when I read there in Isaiah this morning, you read about all the young girls in Israel in that time with all their, their tinkling bells and ornaments and things. You could just see them strutting down the street. But when God seen that haughty attitude and how they could parade themselves, that's what caused God to absolutely bring in the Babylonian army and send them away. And that's why the whole thing jumps to this end time. Look at young womanhood today. I'm not pointing my finger at young people. But it's a shame when we have not hanging before the societies of the world. From any quarter, any sector of leadership, an image of something other that has a right image to follow. If you are conservative, if you are religious, you get condemned. You get your, the finger pointed to you. And I have to say, it's not always going to be like this. I believe, brothers and sisters, America has had enough of this liberal, uncontrolled, do this, do that, anytime, anywhere. They've had just about enough of it. And God's going to turn some conditions loose that's going to start begin, begin to bring things in check. And a lot of people are not going to like what they see. They're not going to like what they hear. They're not going to like what they have to put up with. And I have to say, if I could, if I could speak to every black brother and sister, get Jesus in your heart, get him in your heart filled with truth. Know what truth is, know what values is. Because if you're only looking at this from the standpoint of physical materialism, 
you're going to seek and perish with it. Because God hates it and despises it. You'll not even find it in words in history. When his people of old got turned loose like that, there came a day when God turned his back on them. And when they did scream, did God hear no? The day will come, you will would to God that night was here. And then when night, you would to God that morning was here. And God said, I will not hear. I'll turn my back on you. And so tonight, <clears throat> I have to believe. In our intellectual world, they have run rampant for the last 40 years. Teaching every kind of a negative subject that degrades, demoralizes, tears character principles down. And leadership is only looked at. Are you a great musician? Are you a great athlete? Are you a great actor? It used to be, brothers and sisters, that spiritual men that made a name for the mission work they've done. That's not even in the picture no more. There's a little story that goes like this. This man and his family had spent years of their lives in the mission fields. They had been all over the world doing missionary work to the unlearned, the unsaved. And finally now then this man, he's in his older years of life. And he heard of this ship coming in. And that on this ship was certain, we will say, political, intellectual images of people. This was back before they rode by uh, airplane. So he, would thought, he thought he would go down to the dock to just see this beautiful ship come in with all of these personalities on it. And all of these personalities are going to have the first chance to get off of the ship to be introduced by a musical band. <clears throat> so this old missionary, he stood watching. Here came that political figure off. Here came another political figure. Here came another, we will say, intellectual professor. Each man was introduced as he walked down the gangplank. And the band was playing the music. And all of these celebrities was met by crowds, their relatives and such. And this missionary stood there waiting, hoping somewhere that it might be said, and here comes missionary so-and-so from such and such a country. But he never heard it. And he began to cry. And he said, Lord, why? Lord, why? Why do they have to get all the attention? And Lord, I've spent most of my life on the fields of missionary labor. And when he stood there looking up into the sky, tears streaming down his face, thinking, Lord, it don't look like it's any good. And then the Lord spoke to him in an audible voice. They're having their day. Yours is yet to come. <laughs> and I'll have to say, young people, you probably don't get much recognition in this, whether you're going to school, whether you're going to college, if you let it be known what you believe and your lifestyle. But just hold on to what you got. Because there's a day coming when Jesus is going to come. And it ain't everybody's going to hear that voice. Rise, come up hither. It's only those that's got an ear. And their hearts is tuned with God. And I have to say, young people, that isn't too far off. To me, it's going to be wonderful. Nothing in this world will hold you back from that moment of time. Well, a lot of events in this world is creating millions and millions of unhappy hearts and, and tears. Well, I decided I wasn't going to keep you long tonight. Our political world has denied the Bible. You know what I begin to see in the political spectrum? That even in Israel, the leaders are Jews. They're back there. We know from the overall standpoint 
They become a part of the, uh, the majority of Jewish people that's there for the reclaiming of the land. But I see also from their leadership, their leaders do not have a biblical picture in their hearts why they're back there. They want to be leaders of liberal domestic ideas that we can all live together no matter what race we are, no matter what our religious outlook is. They want us all to get together and just be one great, big, universal, happy family. The Bible don't picture it like that. But you never hear them quoting the Bible. They've discarded it as though... Well, we can't go by the Bible because if we go by the Bible, then our political philosophy won't work. So they're trying to make political philosophies work without well, having God's sanction on it. And I have to say, it's going to be bad when God says, you've gone far enough. And he calls the whole thing to a halt. So you, when you look at the whole political spectrum, nothing wants God's word to be used. And I have to believe, brothers and sisters, that's why the scriptures words it like it is. He'll make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. Never in my lifetime have I heard the one subject, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the temple spot, mentioned as much as we have in the last six months to a year. So it's because this scripture's hanging over our heads. Spiritual people, whether it's Jews or the Gentiles, they know why. They know what's hanging over their head. They know it's in front of us. But the political leaders are going down the road as if, hey, we're going to reshape the new millennium. No, they're not. They're saying a lot of things just as it begins, but I have to say, before it even gets started, God's going to start inserting some things. And you've heard it said, going to throw a monkey wrench in the gearbox. And I'll, have to, I'll be glad when it breaks all the teeth off of the thing and the thing flies apart because the momentum is going to slow up. So, brothers and sisters, tonight, and the music world, look what it has done. I'll say this tonight. Even your music that is, we will say, written from your uh, classical music styles today, it is no longer tunes nor melodies that has lasted as long as Beethoven and those type of musicians was back in the Middle Ages. Most of that music then, brothers and sisters, I've listened to it when you step into a store. It has a soothing sound to it. I didn't grow up listening to that. I, I more or less grew up listening to bluegrass music. But I'll say this. The bluegrass music that I listened to when I was a little boy don't sound like that today. We was listening to the Grand Ole Opera last night. And that new breed of bunch of musicians. They couldn't play for a bunch of sick cows. <laughs> they, they write the lyrics. It's sad. And you wonder what in the world. And they're entertaining a sad audience with it. The tone. The words. It all portrays a society falling apart. How long will it last? Goodness sakes alive. Sitting there on the couch with the wife, listening to some of this stuff. I said, when we years ago sat back up there and drive fork or on Daisy Hill, when the radio began to come around, we, we could even afford to get one of them. We got one of these battery jobs from Sir Book. Dad and mother paid it off by payments. The whole thing only cost $39 and something other. Another picture you're looking right at me. <laughs> oh, I tell you, but when we can afford the radio, oh, my land alive. And on Saturday night, the people that didn't have one, here they come. To just sit for about two or three hours, listen to the Grand Ole Opera. You'd hear those songs written. Is that silver-haired daddy of mine? They had a message to them. Some of them might make you cry, but it had a message. It had some principles, a message of principles, of obligation, of duty. It portrays what life's about. 
And once in a while, brothers and sisters, they'd bring in a gospel song that would feed right along with it. But today, the lyrics, the words, it carries a message. Many times of sadness. Something falling apart. And may I say, some of the words they use now, I wouldn't even want my dog to hear it. I heard one said last night some. And he used words, brothers and sisters, I wouldn't even want a dog to hear it if the dog could understand English. To think that an audience will sit and hear a man like this and he's supposed to be a number one top entertainer. But our entertainment world today has sold out on God. They don't want God. They want to be recognized as something great in that musical world. And I have to say, it's got its day. It's writing its message. It's leaving its effect. It's creating its testimony. And I have to say, it's sad. Back when I was a child growing up, every once in a while you hear a little story. Maybe a new family moving into an area. And if the family had children, it wouldn't be long till there would be some, maybe a new boy or two coming into the school or a girl. But this story goes like, it was in a little Midwestern town. <clears throat> and this little country boy, he lived about three miles out of town on a farm. And his name was Johnny. Everything was going all right in the school. No crime. Nobody had much, but everybody was happy. There was a new family moved into this little town of about 300 population. And one day there was a new girl appeared in Johnny's class. And he took one silent glance at that little girl and he thought, my, she's cute. I'd sure like to get acquainted with her. But he was very bashful. He went home and he says, Mama, we got a new girl in class. She's pretty. She's nice. Mommy, I'd like to know, how do you get acquainted with a girl that's new? See, the son always went to mama. And sometimes mama took these things serious. And she says, Johnny, <clears throat> she began to instruct him. Day in, day out. You act like such and such. You don't show off. Be serious, yet be friendly. And when you think you get your courage just right, someday you make it your business to come by where she's at. Because sooner or later you'll hear what her name is. And then you slowly speak her name. See if she glances and looks at you. So he did. When he passed her, he just said, called her name. She looked right at him, gave him that sweet little smile, and he went home all elated. Mama, I did what you said. And you know, she looked at me. She gave me the sweetest little smile, Mommy. <laughs> Mommy, <clears throat> if you want to date a girl, how should you go about it? Well, here Mommy has another. Problem on hand. How to instruct this little boy of hers? Well, when I get this done, I'll quit. <laughs> because it's the closing of my message. It's all about music. So finally one day Johnny asked him, Mama, I'm a country boy. Now she's a city girl. Now imagine living in a little old town, 300 population. She was just close to the country because it was around everywhere. <clears throat> so her, his mommy began to instruct him words he used. Words that city people would use, not country people. And she began to school him in all of this grammar. How to pronoun pronounce certain words, when to use certain words, certain topics to talk about. 
Well, she got him all educated. And so he got his courage up at school one day. He slipped by this little girl, and he asked her, called her by name, would you allow me to come and see you? And she nodded, uh-huh. Oh, he went home so happy. Mommy, that little girl, I asked her if I could come and see She said, uh-huh. Now, Mommy, how should I ask her when? So Mommy again begins to instruct him. <clears throat> so it worked around. We'll say a certain Saturday evening while well, he had asked her through the week, yes, he could come to see her on that Saturday afternoon. So on that Saturday afternoon, he gets all cleaned up and he walks three miles into the edge of this little town. And she told him what house it was. Now he's got his grammar all arranged. He's got his subjects, the topics all lined out. He had his whole evening planned. So, <clears throat> when he gets in front of the house, he got real nervous because he figured her dad would come to the door. <laughs> so he, he managed to get up on the porch, but he's very reluctant to knock on the door. Finally, he knocks on the door, and the door opens immediately. And here stood the face of a nice-looking man. Yes? Oh, you must be Johnny. And he stood there very nervous. Uh, Yes. Well, you must be wanting to see, we'll say, Mary. Well, she, come on through here. So he took him through the house and introduced him then to his wife, which was the girl's mother. And I says, Mary is out on the back porch. She's in the swing right now. She don't know you here. Just go on out there. So Johnny nervously, he makes his way on through the house and out the back. And there Mary was sitting in the swing. And so he sits down in the swing. Now, just imagine the old type of swing on the back porch. And so he starts with his vocabulary and topics. First it's this and then it's that. Then it's something else, but he introduces all the topics and she just joins right in. And they're having a good time talking about all these things. After a while, then the girl's daddy stuck his head out the door. Said, Mary, me and your mom's going to walk down the street here to some neighbors. Said, if you want any refreshments, says it's in here in the old ice box ahead. Not a refrigerator, just a plain old ice box. So uh, they left. So here they are sitting on the back porch, and the sun's sinking lower and lower in the west. Finally, Johnny, he begins to come down to his last category. And he introduced that subject, <clears throat> and she joined right in. But then there they sat in the swing, and Johnny's missing. He's run out of topics. And poor little Mary, she don't know what to say, so they're both sitting like this. And the sun is sinking low in the west. Down the street, Somebody, it's a hot summertime, they got a window open and a little old radio turned on. And one of Beethoven's symphonies is playing. And Mary is sitting there, she's listening to that music. But Johnny, he's listening to crickets chirping down here in the flower bed. And directly Mary says, that's pretty music, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So he waits a while. He says, you know how they make that sound? Uh-uh. Well, they rub their two back feet together. <laughs> you see? Her mind's listening to one thing. You can tell. <laughs> That's dating in his first episode. <laughs> Well, she didn't think too much about that. But poor Johnny had to come to his last subject. He got up nerve enough to say, 
And he's drawing on this new educated language he was told to use. He said, did you all raise any poultry this year? She said, Dad planted some down there in the flower garden, but the chicken scratched it all out. <laughs> now, why did I tell this? Because I'm portraying you an era of time when a lot of courtship, brothers and sisters, created just about a nervous situation as that. Because they didn't have nothing to learn on TV nor radio. How many understand what I'm talking about? That's why I say, young girls, don't order your boyfriend off of the computer. Because you won't find them already made. God made you. He put a mentality in you to be able to look at the male species and to come to some kind of an we will say, understanding, who have I been talking to? Have you caught their personality? Do you like what they talk about? Do you like how they say it? These have got to be things. Because life, brothers and sisters, many times to you is unrehearsed. How many understand my point? It's unrehearsed. You can't use a movie. There ain't nothing on the computer that you can use as a plan. Because God didn't create you and design you that way. Because you are a spirit being. You have a certain intellect. And I have to say, if you're allowed to grow up with God as that first object that you should re begin to rely upon for the guidance and leadership, God's right there to help you, no matter how young you are. And that's why many times, brothers and sisters, you could take two young people that you, in your own way of looking at it, why, they're, they're not made for each other, and yet somehow or other, conditions come along in life and bingo. That boy's attracted to that girl, and girl's attracted to that boy, and you say, well, what are they God that I ain't God? Well, they saw something in each other that you didn't see, and they went after it. And I have to say, they got married and became happy ever after. That's the way the story used to be written. And I'll say this in close. It was rarity that 50 and 60 years ago you ever heard of a divorce. And when you ever heard of a, of a child having to be taken to an orphanage, it was because somewhere the parents are dead. <clears throat> Our dilemma has come along and made it necessary. But look at the hundreds and thousands today that's born into this godless society. Little children crying, Mommy, Daddy. They want a real Daddy. They want a real Mommy. They want a Daddy that'll pick him up and set him on his knee, put his arms around his shoulder, and tell him what he's going to do when he gets a little older. But now Dad's gone. And Mommy, she ain't worth two cents. She wants to give him up, turn him over to some kind of other homes. Young girls are like that today. Not all. But to see a little child <clears throat> crying, where's my daddy? That little creature was born, created by God for his little human instincts to, get, to begin to reach out. And he knows he looks to mommy for food, but he looks to his dad to provide him security. Something to wear. But even our intellectuals are saying that it don't have to be that way. Now they push the single parent homes. Then the gay homes. And God's going to blow them all in hell. <clears throat> That's why I say, brothers and sisters... There's something coming down the road that's going to blow things to pieces. And young girls, please. When I use the topic that a woman will chase a man, it's out there in the modern world. It's a sign of the day. 
A lot of your college campuses, it, it occurs. But you just ain't seen the fact yet come until a few more disasters hits this world and begins to take human life by the thousand and toll. In some places, brothers and sisters, the day will come before you leave this world. You'll hear it said. Manhood is so scarce. Now the women in that place are shacking up with one man. Because at least they're not lesbians. They want to spend their life with a man. Because to them it's a comfort. The Bible's got to be fulfilled. And it will be. How many believes that? Conditions will necessitate it. And there ain't a thing our modern leadership today can do to change it. It's coming. So I have to say, I count it a privilege to be a, a part of a congregation. I hope I have not said anything to portray a picture wrong. That's not my purpose. I just thank the Lord for young people. I don't want to ever give the impression that I'm some old cranky, crabbit, overbearing person that can't look down upon. I know you live in an hour I didn't live in. Yes, many times it has its points. But I just say, just be careful. Go down the pathway of life and ask the Lord to guide you. And that's why I've said many times to young parents just coming in here, Bring that little child. Don't leave it set at home like the Catholics do. Don't put it in the, the hands of a, a babysitter. No. Let it grow up here. Because sooner or later, it'll grow up here to become a, a part of this congregation. Yes, right now, that you may not think they're listening to a thing. One of these days, brother and sister, you'll hear that little old voice crack out something other and you'll laugh about it. Well, they still heard that. That's the beginning. And I'll have to say, when they're kept at home until they're teenagers before they're ever allowed to darken the door, then they come in here and they act like a bunch of wild animals. Where am I at? When can I get loose? <laughs> What's he going to say? So let them grow up here. It becomes part of their life. And when they could grow up feeling that they're loved and they're wanted, then I have to say, you won't have half the problems with them then as you will to let them go until they're a teenager. When they're a teenager, that's what they want to be on their own. They don't want to be told anything. So I said I'd shut up, so I will. Now, don't send this to Israel. Don't send it to Israel. I didn't preach it for Israel. I preached it for Faith Assembly. <laughs> Heavenly Father, tonight, I thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. You've been good to me, Lord. And I pray, Father that I might through these services said the right thing. I don't want to leave the wrong impression, Lord, but I pray that I might have brought out in an illustrative way a thought that can be used, Lord, to help us as mortals to plan our tomorrows and to know how to walk down the pathway. Bless these young people, Lord. You see what, Lord, there's th is thrown at them every day in this social domestic world we live, I pray, Lord, give them strength and courage, boldness and the willingness to look at life for what it really is when you are the one that is allowed to lead and direct us. So, Lord, I thank you for a congregation like this. And we know, Lord, there's many across this world, brokenhearted, sad little children, crying tonight, where has my daddy gone? Where's my mommy gone? They're wanting to be loved, Lord. God, may you hasten the day when you will come and change the whole order of events. And there will be a kingdom set up. And there will be a government established. And in that day, there will be no more tears, Lord. There will be peace. As the old song goes, peace in the valley. How that will be sung. I pray, Lord, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.